All right, guys. So this morning, I'll get your notes out there. So we are going to talk about uh, uh, righteousness in the right relationship. So I want to I want to really get into this, and and I'm going to give you some principles that that I believe are going to set you free. And and I don't think we talk about too much, but it's something that I've adopted in in not just my marriage, but in in, in relationships. And and so um, I'll, I'll tell you this much. When I first got saved, everybody knows my testimony for the first, you know, two years. Uh, I, I had a, a tax every single night because I would read the Bible. You know, as soon as I go to sleep, I was being choked with the Bible, my pillow, my bed's being kicked. You know, I'm going through all sorts of crazy for about two years. And I didn't know who I could talk to about it because I knew a lot of people could not relate. But it's just interesting, you know, in the last couple of years when I bring up the topic, there's other people that raise their hand and say, me too. It's just a topic that people don't want to talk about. Anyways, so I start my, you know, when I, when I first got saved, you know, a lot of these attacks started happening. And I remember I would come home, I'd grab my gym bag. And after I grabbed my gym bag, I'm like, I'm going to go ahead and go to the gym. And right when I got into the garage, I remember one day the Lord said, are you going to spend time, you know, uh, in the gym or do you want to spend time with me? And I'm like, oh, so I put my gym bag down, my gym bag down. I went back in my, my room. I'd bought a house with my brother. So it's just him and my brother. We bought a house together. And so I went back up my room, I got in the word, I got in my worship, and I just started this, this journey, you know, as far as, you know, finding out God who had called me to the ministry, had said he's the healer, who he said he's the deliverer, and I start going down this journey. Well, even though a lot of, a lot of what I went through was, was, I think, horrible, man, I grew in grace, I grew in wisdom and revelation, and, you know, still growing, still working it out, um, you know, but after two years, you know, the attacks had stopped. But what I grew accustomed to is that level of freedom that I fought for, right? I, I, I was a new creation. I got out of this lifestyle. And then I have this newfound freedom <clears throat> that God was calling me into every single day. At the end of two years, God's telling me, he goes, get out of your room and, and, and go. I said, hold on a sec, God. I said, two years ago, you know, and this is the Holy Spirit. Two years ago, you want me to establish this relationship. And now you're and now you're kicking me out of my bedroom, you know, because I grew accustomed to this intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And he goes, you're no good to me in this, in this bedroom anymore. He goes, I need you to get out and I need you to get amongst people. And so what happens is I get kicked out and I go back to the gym. The very thing that, that God said, hey, you know, gave me that choice. And we know character isn't developed apart from choices. Gave me that choice to then go out into the gym. But then it was, I now had to let people back into my life. But you have to understand, this, this is a freedom that I fought for, right? And it's very scary when you fought for a certain level of freedom to start allowing people or giving that freedom away to people in fear that you're going to have to fight for it again. You know, so these are the emotions that I'm dealing with. And, you know, and, and so God brought me to a word, you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it was a relational word. It had to deal with my marriage, but it also had to deal with, with um, you know, with, with relationships and business, with friends, you know, things like that. Because I know that we can get to a certain level in Christ where we kind of want to protect the very thing that we fought for. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm not saying, hey, you go back to drinking alcohol or anything like that. But what I am saying is when you do fight for something, you got to allow people to enjoy the freedom that you have. You know, Romans 8.21 says, that there's people that are going from bondage to de to decay, and they want to be in 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 and experience the freedom that you have. So we got to start allowing people back into our lives, right? So I'm going to go into First Corinthians seven. First Corinthians seven is going to be my focus. You know, I know a couple of you. You know, I ask, hey, would you step out and, and share some things? So I'm going to mention some things, and and I'm going to give you guys some pointers. I believe that's really going to set you free. And, and uh, because there are things that I've adopted from other pastors that, that sometimes aren't really preached from the pulpit, but it's just kind of the behind the scenes talks that we have from one another. And there's things that are caught and they're not always taught. And I'll catch certain things that people say, and I'm like, oh, and then I'll find it in the word and, and the Holy Spirit will tell me the revelation they were ministering from that they really didn't explain. So in 1 Corinthians 7, 20 and 24, I'm going to go back to 7, 14. So I'm going to go, uh, go to 1 Corinthians 7, 20 and 24. This is going to be in the Passion Version. It says so, uh, and, and, and it starts off living the life that God has assigned. 
It, um, so 1 Corinthians 7, 20, 24. So everyone should continue to live faithful in the situation of life in which they were called to follow Jesus. So it's saying to stay in that place, right? And it then asks the question, were you a slave when you heard the call to follow Jesus? Don't let that concern you. Even if you gain your freedom, make the most of the opportunity. So it's saying, stay where you're at, experience the freedom that God has given you right where you're at, and don't look to change all these things. So for, for truly, if you are called to a life union with the Lord, you are already a free man. And those who are called to follow Jesus when they are free are now the Messiah's slaves. Since a great price was paid for your redemption, stop having the mindset of a slave. Brothers and sisters, we must remain in close communion with God, no matter what our situation is, when we were first called, called to follow Jesus. So it's saying is when we experience salvation, don't go out and don't try and feel that you got to change all these things. Don't go out and feel like you got to change all these people. It's saying you discovered this freedom. Now stay right where you're at. Now, now watch this. This is going to be a profound statement because it really impacted me. I, I'm reading one of the, one of the books uh, by by Horobin, and he asked this question. He asked the question, "Can a doctor heal a bone?" And I talked to Kristen about it. Kristen's a nurse, and Kristen says, "No." I said, "What is the doctor's job?" She said, "The doctor's job is to reset that bone." So we're talking about the physical makeup of a person. The doctor's job is to reset that bone. What does your body do? Your body knows what it needs to do in order to heal and grow itself. Now, that's from the physical side. Now we have these doctors that when you come in with an emotional condition, how do they treat the emotional condition? They treat it from a physical perspective by trying to give you medication, right? So they're trying to give you medication. If you have anxiety, here's the pills. But here's what we have to realize. If a bone is not reset cor correctly, it develops and it heals wrong. And what happens? We, if it's in your leg, you form a limp, you don't have the maximum use. So on a level of a one to 10, 10 meaning it's awesome, it's perfectly healed, you may be on the level of a six because the bone did not get set properly. The doctor's job is not to heal you. The doctor's job is to reset you. It's your body's job, the way God created you to, to be, to actually grow itself, right? Now, let me ask you this. We're talking about the condition of your emotions because there's a link between the physical side, emotional side, and the spiritual side. We're a triune being. We understand that. I'm not going to get too much into this. But we also have to understand from an emotional perspective, if I'm broken emotionally, right, and I go to the doctor, how is the doctor going to treat that and how is he going to reset me so I can go ahead and get him? Well, he's going to prescribe medication. He may say go see counseling or, all, you know, somebody else. But ultimately, they're going to try and tackle the emotional issue based on their expertise, right? But the Bible says that we are created in the image of God, and the image of God we are created in Genesis 1 and 27. So if I have an emotional problem, what does God offer humanity for a reset? He offers salvation. Oh, so in salvation, I can get my, my spirit and I can get my soul in alignment. I can get the reset through salvation in Jesus Christ. And what happens? I'm now in the right place to where now I can start growing. Why? Because my path is set by the Lord. So I'm talking about when you get that newfound freedom, you know, and you see people that are in bondage, your job is not to go to those people and reset them and then start fixing them. That's God's job, right? And so we got to, at some point in time in our lives, start trusting God in the process. What is our job? Our job is to introduce Jesus the burden remover, the yoke destroyer, right, is to introduce Jesus from an emotional perspective. What's going to happen? Alignment will be created with God. And when we talked about, you know, Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And what does it say? All your needs are going to be met. You're going to have a reset emotionally, or you're going to reset spiritually. You're going to have a reset emotionally because of spirit, then soul, and your body is going to correct itself. That's why when it talks about praying for the sick, it's going to say in James 5, 14 through 16, confession is the first thing. Forgiveness is the second thing. Laying hands is the third thing. Interesting. Pierce for our transgressions. Crush our inequity. The chastisement that gives us peace was upon. By his stripes, we are healed. Physical is last. Why? Because your spiritual and emotional condition 
affect your physical makeup. There has to somehow be a, a reset emotionally with God in order for somebody to start growing correctly. It's just like a bone. If you turn to alcohol, if you turn to medication, what's happening? You are developing you know, are you growing? Yes, but you're growing the wrong way. So just like you're, 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 you know, you break your leg, you're a six out of 10. Well, emotionally, it's the same perspective. You know, you're emotionally incompetent, right? So what it's saying is in first Corinthians 7, 24, is that God is going to free you right where you're at, right? So a reset, you know, in your bone or a reset in your spirit or a reset in your emotion puts you on the right path for growth. As a Christian, I don't micromanage people's growth. Now, what I do is I will guide you when you come to me, right? Because I believe when somebody comes to the church that they're hearing the word of God. John 10, 27 says, my sheep know my voice. So I don't control people, right? Because control is witchcraft. And a lot of times the spirit of religion will tie into witchcraft because we now like to control people. So the reason I bring this up is God brought this verse to me. And he had given me words of knowledge for people. I mean, I was telling, I, I told one person exactly what he was going to do the following week, what his plan was, you know, and God told me, bought a, bought a plane ticket. He's going to go here. Here's what he's going to do. I came home from the gym and I dropped it. And, and, you know, and because God spoke to me, it did not mean that I was supposed to go in there and control the situation. You know, what I was supposed to do was create a reset in their life through the word of God, not add to it, not take away, but what God desired to do in the situation and then leave it the heck alone. But me, because I'm a knucklehead, when I see people going, you know, and doing things that I know that they shouldn't be doing, then all of a sudden I try and grab these people and get them right back on track. But that's not my job. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. Now, if they come to me and they ask me, then I'm going to go ahead and say, this is what I think. But what I have to do from that point on is once there's a reset, I pray them through. Why? The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. I lift them up to him and like the stream of water, God says he'll direct them where he pleases, not where I please, but where he pleases. So he's God. My job is to reset them by bringing them to the healer. Amen. So in, in, this, in this scripture, I put in here, if God appoints the union, then continue your freedom and stay right where God's called you. So it's talking about if you're a slave, then stay a slave. It's saying it's more important that you're free in your spirit and your emotions than being free in your body, right? And so it's a good place to start is what he's saying. And if you fought to get free, then you have to store your freedom. And this means that you have to share your freedom. Same thing. After two years, God kicked me out of my closet. He goes, you're no good to me here. You will press into God for so long and God will say, now get out of your bedroom, get out of your office, get out of your church and start go start sharing your freedom. Why do we run to the church in the first place? Because we got violated. And what did we do? We fought to get that freedom back, right? And now we fought to get that freedom back. And God is saying, now go create relationships with it. And then we're like, well, hold on a sec, God, because now we want to try and control our own freedom. You're not stewarding it well, right? Freely you receive, freely give. You forget that one, Matthew 10 and 8. So we got to start sharing the freedom. So anyways, I'm going to open that up. I got... Two more sections I want to cover. I don't know if uh, James, if you want to come out. I don't know if Kristen, if you want to come out. Otherwise, I'll keep going. Cool. I'm going to keep going. So 1 Corinthians 7, 14. It says, now I know I started down in verse 20. And if you guys want to step out, just let me know. And, and you can step on my toes a little bit. I'm fine. But it says, 1 Corinthians 7, 14, watch this. For the unbelieving husband has been made holy by his believing wife, and the unbelieving wife has been made holy by her believing husband by virtue of his or her sacred union to a believer. So this is actually under the context of a divorce, but our call is to live a life in peace, right? And if God has created you in his likeness, think about this. If God created you in his likeness, then your likeness or your righteousness is going to come into contact and touch the very people that you connect with. So we have to first have faith in who we are and what we've been called to be, right? We have to have that faith. So we have to understand, you know, again, who we are and what God has called us to. And we have to be secure in that. Once we're secure in that, God will then put you out into other people's lives and say, now I want you to share this freedom. Now I want you, because you know who you are, because your identity is in Jesus, I want you to share that with other people, right? So that has to expand. So 
we understand that there's a power of righteousness. Now, I believe that, you know, when, when it comes to business relationships, you heard me talk about Matthew 33, you heard me talk about the hierarchy of needs, the food, the water, the clothes, the housing, the job, the security that the world depends on, that the kingdom of God is different, that our covenant actually covers all that stuff. So it says, don't worry about it. You have a superior covenant, which is in the kingdom of God and his, his righteousness. That's already covered. So you heard me talk about, I don't worry about all that stuff. What do I do? I focus on kingdom. And what does God do? God brings these people in my, in my life. Folks, when I got a divorce, um, I had a life of freedom already planned out. I was like, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to work on my businesses. I'm going to go make a butt ton of money. And, and I'm going to just do my thing. Then all of a sudden, I walk into escrow. And here's this hot little blonde checking me out. I mean, I don't blame her. Um, I got the mic right now. Anyway. Not, ne not naturally blonde. Just a few highlights. No, she looked blonde, right? So anyway, so it wasn't in the plan. But here was the scary thing. I look at Christian, and the Lord speaks to me. He says, that's the wife. And he said, and it's the mother of your two children. And I'm like, my first question is like, okay, well, that's kind of messed up. And you just kind of jacked up my plan, God, because I had this whole life of freedom where I'm just going to do things on my own. I kind of like hanging out by myself and doing my own thing and coming and going as I please. I like that. And God said, because you are free, I'm going to ask you now to steward it. I was like, what did you say? He said, because you're free, I'm going to ask you now to steward it. He said, you don't need to, to isolate yourself and be an introvert anymore. You understand who you are and you understand the freedom that you walk in. Now I'm going to ask that you share your freedom to get other people free. And I'm like, well, this messes up my plan. I'm like, well, by the way, God, does she know that like I'm the dude? And I hear nothing. And I'm like, oh. So then I dropped my keys and then I've turned around. She's looking. I'm like, okay, there's debates in the water. She bit, boom, got, no, I'm just kidding. So anyways, so we end up obviously ending up where we ended up. But, you know, it wasn't in the cards for me. My whole point is I didn't go out looking for stuff. God always brought them to me. That's when I talk about Matthew 6. You know, 25, it says the cure for anxiety, verse 33, I delight myself in the Lord and God brings things to me. I wasn't going out looking for wifey. I wasn't looking for businesses. I wasn't looking for anything. I was sowing my time, talent, and treasure into the kingdom and God starts bringing these things into my life. And all I had to do when people, when opportunities came in was use a sense of discernment, Hebrews 5 and 14, to differentiate the difference between a good idea and a God idea. You know, but we had some problems, you know, in this relationship and in this relationship, um, you know, I'm older than, 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 than Christian, I think eight or nine years, nine years. Um, and, and there was a maturity level. I was 34. She was 25. Right. And I was high five and people like, Hey, Robin the cradle anyways. So that, but there was a maturity difference, but there was also a difference because I had been walking in kingdom for, you know, uh, for eight years. So eight years, I'm in the word. And now Kristen went to church, you know, through, through college and, and everybody has a different upbringing. Everybody has a different relationship, but I was at a higher level of faith and a higher level of freedom than she was. Right. And what I had to do is I had to share my freedom with her, but here's what we had to, here's what we had to uh, realize is we have this tendency to protect our freedom. And in protecting our freedom, we will place demands on people at our level of freedom. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we start making people jump through hoops in these relationships. So I'm going to get to the scripture, but here's one thing that I realized, and, and I got this from Casey Treat and, and Wendy Treat, and he said this years ago, and then, and then Pastor Darren repeated it to me. And I didn't get it when they first saw it. I was just kind of like, you know, one of these things in church and, and, and really didn't understand it. And here's what he said. He said, I had to give my wife room to grow into my gifting. And I thought about that. And I heard Pastor Darren say it to me again. And I'm like, oh, and what he was saying is we have to trust in the reset that's happening in their lives. Watch this. So I'm going to tell you how to avoid 10,000 arguments. So when Chris and I got together, I'm walking at this standard. Now, she's a Christian. She's a believer. She's right here now. But I demanded she walk up here. So if 
she would come home because she's a nurse. Well, I feel like I got a headache. And I'm like, well, so be it according to your faith, you got a headache. And or if, you know, she kind of roughs somebody up or whatever. And I'm like, and you call yourself a pastor, you know, and I'm sitting there. I'm kind of getting frustrated because I'm like, you know, better than this because we're pastors. But she wasn't where I was at. And what was I doing? I was hammering her and I was telling her to come up to a level that she wasn't ready for. And I wasn't giving her the grace or the room to grow in the gifting. Right. Or when we're up at the altar. She's sitting there praying, you know, tie my bow tie, untie my bow tie, you know, just praying. And then I walk up, boom, touch somebody, power of God hits him. We're in a car going home and she's frustrated. She goes, how come God didn't, you know, touch him the way he touched you? And, and so now we got these arguments going on. And what I realized is I was trying to hold my wife up to my standard. And my job was to just simply pull her into grace, hit the reset button, and let her grow at her pace. Now, I'm going to lead it. I'm going to cover her. I'm going to protect her. But when I start bickering with her, and when I start picking fights with her, because she's not at my level, what does she do? Rejection. She's like, I can't do it. I can't walk in your anointing. I can't pray like you. I can't. And she's like, you know, and, and how you pray. And also, I can't do that. And what does she want to do? I just want to quit. So the very thing that you want to do with that significant other, it could be a business relationship. It does not matter. When we try and, and, and pull people up to our standard too soon, you're actually getting rejection. And you're like, sinner, you know what I mean? But it's like, no, your job is to walk out your freedom. Your job is to trust God in that process in the other person's life. And can I tell you something, women? You guys in your mind, Think of eight, 10 things to do all at once. You can't put eight, 10 things on me because guess what I'm going to give you? Heck no. Why? Because men's minds don't think that way. One thing at a time, ladies. You give me one thing at a time. Am I working on one thing right now? Yeah, I was working on this message and it forced me to evaluate my heart. It forced me to evaluate my relationship, right? That's what I'm working on right now. And if you're out there saying, well, I'm fine and I'm not working on any issues. I'm like, you're not hearing the voice of God then because... I'm, I'm doing pretty good at right where I'm at, but God told me in some issues, he goes, you suck, right? So I have to be able to take that criticism and say, okay, God, what do you want me to do about it now, right? So Kristen, I don't know if you want to jump in because I keep going. If she doesn't, I'll jump yeah. in. After right. you're done, I'll jump in. All right. Okay, sure, James. Um, just real fast, how you're talking about coming up to your level it's not always necessarily coming up to someone's level though, but feeling like <clears throat> maybe they're on just a different page entirely. The, the way someone does something is necessarily the way you do things and you expect people to be able to do things the way you do it. And so then instead of looking at their potential in their gifts or where they're strong, you may expect them to walk your walk or do things your way rather than do it their way or do it the way that God has called them to do it. And so that becomes your center of focus then when you're all tied up on these details and these little idiosyncrasies that these people have as they're trying to grow and they're trying to overcome these certain hurdles or issues that they have you need to look at their potential and give them room to grow and um i mean obviously in greg in my case it's me coming up to his level of spiritual maturity but there's not just me coming up to his level but also me coming across in in other aspects and him coming across in other aspects, not, not that we have to become better or, or anything, but, but just merge, so to speak. <clears throat> so yeah, James, you can go ahead and speak if you'd like. Oh, okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I was just going to say, I definitely want to jump. Sorry, here, let me move this camera. Uh, yeah, I definitely want to jump on that. Um, I love what we're talking about with the grace, right, with relationships. Um, you know, 
a lot of times, and I was talking to Greg about this yesterday, um, a lot of times we have to have grace because we come from different areas, right? We come from different places in life. And when you do, you have past hurts, right? We have past traumas, past things that we bring into our relationships. And for me, one of the things that I had brought in was I had, you know, there, there's triggers, right? And so with my girlfriend and I, we, um, we had a discussion like not even a week ago, I want to say, and, you know, the thing was she had, I don't remember what happened, but I know that I reacted a certain way. And the reason I reacted, it was like a hairpin trigger, right? And so we had talked about it and we were good. But what I had to explain was, hey, this is not how I feel. This is just how I reacted because of my past hurts and my past traumas. I'm so quick to react that way because of how I've been hurt that I, I have to get past that and get into that explanation of it as I'm working on it, right? And so as I'm working on myself and the things that I've got going on, things that, you know, the traumas that I've, uh, I've dealt with and I, and I have to work through, um, asking her to have grace for me the same way I have to have grace for some of the things, right? You know, because no one's perfect, right? So there's sometimes I have to have grace for her and for her, for her triggers and for the way that she reacts sometimes, right? But one of the things that we talked about that I really liked was, um, was on top of having grace, we got to have appreciation for the person who's giving us grace, right? Because I remember her asking me, she's like, well, okay, well, I'm going to, well, well, I'm going to give you grace for this. She's like, well, it's not really fair to me, but I understand it. Okay. I'll give you grace. And in return, she says, well, do you need to have grace for me? I said, I said, I need to have grace for you on the things you need grace on. But what I need to have for you when you're giving me grace is appreciation for that grace, right? So we need to make sure that it's not going unnoticed. You know what I mean? Like when you're working on something, that's great. And when you have someone willing to, to give you grace, and that's in any type of relationship, we have to make sure that we're, we're acknowledging that, right? And we're appreciating that and that we're not taking advantage of those things. So we have to make sure that when that's happened, that we appreciate them, right? And we show them that and we tell them that and we make sure that we're acknowledging them because it's really important, right? Because again, we're always going to have to show grace for each other. Uh, there's always going to be different things. And as we're working on ourselves, if somebody is willing to work with us through our crap, whether that be a boyfriend, girlfriend, and husband, wife, a mentor, a mentee relationship, whatever that is, even, you know, family, brothers, sisters, you know, we have to make sure that, that we're acknowledging that and that we're not taking advantage of it because that could easily happen where you say, well, this is an issue I have. You're going to have to deal with it. No, this is an issue I have and I don't want you to have to deal with it. So I appreciate you dealing with it, but I want you to know that I am getting getting help for this. And, and we have to make sure too, that we are getting help for these things, right? So if we're, if we have an issue with something, you can't just say, well, I'm not going to have that issue and let it be that, right? That's just like a person who beats up their husband or wife, right? And then they say, well, I'll never do it again, but then they don't get help for it. Okay. Well, nothing has actually changed mentally other than the fact that they're trying to do what they can to keep the person. So then they, they promise them things, but they don't ever actually get any help. Like if we have things we need to work on counseling right deliverance that's the whole point of this deliverance and inner healing is because if you're not actually doing something to change the things that need to be changed about yourself then there's never going to be a change right and that's why this class is so important especially to me because i know there's so many things that i'm still working on that i know that i need to get delivered from and i know i need to get you know inner healing with right and uh once we start doing those things and walking those out, again, we're not going to be perfect. However, we will be in the place to be a lot healthier and, you know, it, make it a lot less stressful on those that are, are working with us, right? Those that are being around us and those that are loving us because ultimately, you know, we want to love people just as much as they're loving us, right? More. We want to love them more, right? And, and in order for us to really be able to be in that healthy place to really love them and actually give them good advice, we have got to be in that place of, of understanding and getting in and accepting where our triggers are and saying, okay, yep, this is a trigger. I did act this way. I didn't mean to act this way. I apologize for it. This is why I acted that way. This is the trigger that I have. Okay, 
I'm going to get into these books. I'm going to get into these things. I'm going to start working on these things. And as I'm working on them, I just need you to have grace. I want you to know I'm doing something about it. I also want you to know I really appreciate the fact that you're actually willing to work with me. You know, because I know it's not easy and I know it's not fair, right? We got to acknowledge that it's, it's not fair to them, you know, and, um, and, and really just appreciate that. So that's just, I, I wanted to, uh, to put that out there to just, um, to just take that grace and really take that to the next level and say, okay, when people are showing us grace, show that appreciation and, and work on these things that we need to work on. I, I agree with you. And, and that's a good word. And we cannot, uh, we can't attack the areas of, of grace in, in other people's lives. I mean, if God's working on somebody in a certain issue and it's a trigger that that god's working with them then if that area becomes the area of focus well that's the thing that's going to continually manifest and the more you the more you touch on that subject the more it becomes an issue the more it's going to manifest and it's going to go backwards again the end result is going to be rejection and if you want somebody to get better then you have to start trusting in god that that word that you Put in their life that it won't return void it'll accomplish its goal and it'll prosper in the area that it's sent isaiah 55 and 11 so we have to trust the process the key thing in all this is we have to maintain our salvation and walk it out right we're all at different levels but in order for me to have a relationship with somebody else i have to be secure in my walk now watch this once i'm secure in my walk i got you wanting once i'm secure in my walk and i'm walking this thing out then god is going to start adding people to my life right so I can share that freedom to do what? To get them free and not to micromanage them. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to come to church. But here's the thing. If I'm working on an issue, then Kristen has that right out of curiosity. Well, what's the issue that you're working on? You know, because I know her. She'll be like, I'm going to give you eight things right now. Not, not bickering, but that's just the way she thinks. She's very organized. I'm very flighty. I'm very driven. I look at the end point. I don't look at the details in between. It's just the way I think. She may pull back a little bit and ask me about some of the details. And I'll tell her what God's speaking to me. And in fact, she doesn't ask me because I talk more than a woman, apparently. And, 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 and so I will tell her daily, she's in the shower trying to get ready. I bring up my Bible and show her what a highlight. I bring up a book. I did it to her this morning. So she always knows what's on my heart and my mind. And, and with Kristen and I, we're very good communicators. Um, and, and when I first met Kristen, I was an introvert. And like James, I came into a relationship with wounds. Um, I was a person that was very controlled. Um, and, and you would look at me and be like, no, he's kind of a big guy and looks tough. I, I had a former relationship that just battered me emotionally. Just, just kept coming at me, kept coming at me, kept coming at me. And finally, I just rejected that person. I could not meet the standard. And it wasn't a godly standard, but I could not meet the standard. And pretty soon, I didn't realize I'm under this bondage of control. And so I'm kind of like this beaten dog that that when I met Kristen and God's like, you know, that's her. It took Kristen a while to to open up my heart because so many people had hurt me in my past. I've been rejected by the church. You know, I've dealt with a lot of rejection, you know, rejection from family. Um, you know, I dealt with a lot of rejection in my past. And so I didn't immediately let Kristen in. But what I had to do is give her one area of my heart at a time. And I had to be able to trust her. So it was a process. I didn't immediately, you know, and, and, and it had to work its way out. And even through the relationship, because I think it was the same year that I met her, that I basically had an emotional breakdown because of my, my house of cards and me being the tough guy, stuffing it down for so many years, you know, it was actually, it was her dad, you know, uh, uh, that, that came into the room and hugged her brother, Brian says, I love you, son. And nobody noticed it, but I left the room because I didn't have that growing up. And I still don't have that, right? So I was raised in a fatherless home. My father left at an early age. So it's something that I guess maybe people take for granted, but I didn't realize until the age of 34, you know, how much that actually hurt me and bothered me. And it was an area of healing that I had to go through to understand that God's a father to the fatherless. So anyways, Juanita, you, uh, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I wanted to touch on relationship um, with ourselves and the church and moving into ministry and how I can appreciate how life changed church. As I started going into ministry, I was going through some things, but there were people, there were leaders, pastors at life changed church, our 
Greg, Tamiko, uh, Lynn Felice, that scene in me that, um, that things that I didn't see in myself, even though I was going through things, I was welcome to come into ministry and how God started, this started a few years ago, how God started to transform and renew renew me, even though I didn't feel that I was qualified to be in these places, God was bringing me to these places. And as I stepped out and started to be more bold and to trust in him and not to trust in myself, I, he started to open up more doors, more opportunities, more growth. And as I trusted the mentors that I have in my life, I started to, to be teachable, because before my life, I wasn't teachable. I had so much pride and I was in such in, in my own lane that I had so much, so much um, hurt that I was I wasn't able to be able to to teach anybody else. And so by being open, being open to to stepping into ministry, I, I've been able to, you know, see how God is working and see his miracles, not just for my own life, but how he wants to use me for other people's life. And had I not, you know, had I stayed in a, in a place of hurt and a place of shame and condemnation, you know, believe the lies that the enemy was trying to, um, you know, keep deceiving me with, I never would have been where I am today. So, you know, all of our hurt and our shame, you know, it takes us to, it takes us to that. It builds character when we, you know, when we're, when, when we start create having those relationships and trusting those relationships that God places in our lives, those godly relationships and, and knowing that, knowing that, you know, um, there is going to be a little bit of pressure. There's going to be some, 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 um, comfort, but it's not, it's not to, it's not in a way to, for, uh, for failure, but in a way to be successful and to go to that next level. Hey Amen. That's 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 a good word. Um, anybody else have anything? And Juanita, I'll, I'll tell you what. Juanita has, you know, people come in the church. They see Juanita up at the altar. It's it's like, it's like, you know, they don't they don't they see the end result. They don't see the struggle. They don't remember when you first came in and kind of the stuff that you dealt with. You know, I was I was really jacked up when I first came into church. That's why I came into church in the first place. But here's what I know. I know the process worked. Here's what I also know. And, and JD, you're next. Here's what I also know. You know, when, when I read the second Corinthians and I'm in, in seven down at, uh, you know, verse 35, it's, it says all these things that you should do relationally. And it says, so you would have undistracted devotion. It's saying that if you're a single person and you go to get married, it's saying that there's a potential that your, uh, that your distraction can be divided, right? And that's double-mindedness. Double-mindedness or, 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 or being careless is, you know, uh, when your attraction is divided. And what God is saying is he ultimately decides, wants you to expand, you know, your level of freedom, but he wants your devotion to be number one, stay secure in your relationship, right? And then when you can be secure in your relationship, God will bring other people in your life, whether it's, you know, husband, wife, whether it's a business, you know, what have you, but it's just like when he talks about when you dine with a king, don't crave his delicacy. Don't leave your position of devotion, right? Stay who you are. Stay in the freedom that God has called you to, but minister out of that freedom. Serve people out of that freedom. And don't leave that freedom, right? Be secure in who you are. That's how come I can go out. And, and, and you guys have heard some of the stuff, you know, where I'm like out there just telling potty humor jokes that are sometimes border in, borderline inappropriate. But I'm not trying to be like somebody else. For me, I'm always going to try and lighten up the, the atmosphere because I believe a spoonful of sugar will help the medicine go down. Before I drop a word of knowledge on you, before I pray for you, I may lighten up the atmosphere. And to the people that are religious, they'll look at me and like, oh, that's not holy. Well, if you are religious, I'm probably going to tell twice as many jokes, sometimes inappropriate to show you that God's still into me, right? And, and not to be a stumbling block to somebody else, but to be able to get somebody else free. I always minister from my position of freedom, right? Not somebody else's. Kristen is not going to minister from my level of freedom. She's going to minister from her level of freedom. Is she under my covering? Is she under my grace? Absolutely. But I have to let her be her. I have to let her read her own books. I have to let her fellowship with the women, you know, not to control it, right? Let her grow in this thing. My job was to help her in the reset, right? It's her job with God to walk this thing out, right? Uh, JD. 
Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I just really want to thank um, Kristen, uh, Greg, you know, James and Juanita. I thank you so much for, for sharing and being so um, courageous, you know, to grant us transparency in your walk with God and your relationships. This is just so timely and, and it's so helpful right now, especially for me um, in my homebound, because that's my struggle right now is starting because um, um, I have, I'm 15 years ahead of Alex when it comes to the faith and, you know, um, Christianity life. And so that's, so I, I have the same struggle. Um, so I really want to thank you because I feel like I'm the only one who has that struggle. And now um, God's showing me that you're not alone and you have people in your church that you can really um, go to and run to and relate to. That way you can, you know, you can grow um, in grace, especially to Alex. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey, Amen. Hey, hey, and I want to I want to touch on that one too. So my kids are number one. If 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 I'm in a prayer meeting and my kids need me, the prayer meeting ceases. You know, family, family is number one, right? I never told my kids you need to get baptized. You know, I didn't, I didn't put that on my kids. Why? Because I got that counsel from Pastor Darren and, and Pastor Ben Shop. I didn't put these rules because being a pastor's kid is, is tough. Why? Because there's a spiritual attack that's trying to mess with them. It's trying to mess with my seed. So they're already dealing with some pressures. Guess what? When my wife came into the, the marriage, the enemy tried to go after her. You know, she had some anxiety issues and everything else. So it's already tough enough. Why am I going to turn around and add that pressure? I can't. But here's what I can do. I can always give people the opportunity. The ministry you see at the altar is me ministering out of my relationship, my freedom, my walk with Jesus. That's what I'm ministering out of. Not somebody else's, but mine, right? And hopefully people catch that and they can step into that freedom. I'm pursuing my next level. I'm always going for my next level, but I'm not going to demand that you do it the way I do right? I'm not going to demand that you talk the way that I talk. I know that there's amazing communicators. Some people communicate so much better than me. I got that, but I'm okay with me, right? And you got to be okay with you and you have to be secure in your relationship. Once you have that security, God is going to say, now I need you to share that freedom. And I know I keep saying that, but I need you to share that freedom, not come on people and demand that they meet your standard and your requirement because you're going to get rejection, right? So your job is to plant a seed and let it sink in and intercede for those people, pray for those people. If God has called people to your life, the good work he began, he's going to finish it. It says he'll perfect that which concerns you. So as long as there's willingness, man, allow people in your life to grow and not based on your standard, but based on his. Watch this. I talked about my kids. I don't need my kids worshiping my God. Did you hear me? I don't need them worshiping my God. I want them to have their own experience with their God, right? I don't need my kids riding my coattails. I want them to have a personal relationship. I want my wife to have a personal relationship. I want everybody around me to have their own personal relationship, not my God, but theirs. The Bible says in Psalm 34 and 8, it says to taste and see that the Lord is good. A taste is to have an experience. And it says taste and see. Your experience with God will always change your perception of God. The Bible says in John 8, 32, it says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Truth is reality. It's talking about not just a head knowledge, it's talking about an experience, a revelation, a revealing. So it says when you have the knowledge of God revealed in your heart, in whatever, whatever area it's revealed, you are going to be free. But I'm always going to go back and say, trust in the process. Allow the people around you to grow in Christ without you always preaching at them, without you always micromanaging. I'm going to, on the outside of the church, give scripture out of principle, not saying the Bible says the Bible says, because my authority, being the word of God, may not be their authority, but they may trust in me as a person. So what am I going to do? I'm going to drop a little bit of wisdom on them, right? And I know that they need to get free, and I'm going to close with this. We started off 
and I, I started talking about Horman and I just talked about bones resetting and your spirit resetting. We have to trust, you know, this process of Christianity. We have to trust that people hear from God without micromanaging them, you know? And, and so we have to love people first and foremost and allow them to partake in our freedom, right? And, and not to go and micromanage them. That's why you see a lot of people, you know, that are now contacting Life Change Church for deliverance. I'm like, okay, well, I need you to read this book. Well, I need you to come to my house. I'm not going to your house. I need you to come to church. I need you to find out who we are. I need you to establish a relationship with the people at Life Change Church so you understand and know that they love you. Why? Because the snare sheet I'm going to give you is going to be pretty brutal. And if you don't know me, then you're not going to want to be honest with it because it asks some pretty brutal questions about some intimate details about your life. But what do I ask people? I ask people to come into a relationship with us first. I'm not going to run out to you, but I do expect that you, you know, come to us, right? And we'll meet you halfway. There's got to be honor on both sides and honor requires an investment. Every relationship has to have honor in order for it to be equitable. So when people are calling us right now, I'm like, I would like for you to read this book. I'd like you to read Rodney Hogue on Liberated. I'd like you to read Rodney Hogue on Forgiveness. At least read the Forgiveness book. Let's touch base, see where you're at and see how we can get you free. But I'm only going to go your pace. You have to learn how to read people. And you can only go at the pace that they're willing to go and the willingness for them to receive from you, right? And so if you start seeing the do not disturb sign on their church, on their chest, you got to pump the brakes. And we got to trust that God will complete the work that he started in them. But what I'm going what, what to close with is, is we have to trust the process. If God is bringing people in your life, then you have to find the grace for it, right? And I'm not talking about, hey, I just met this guy out of the club and now I got to go fix him. No, I'm talking about the people that God brings in your life that, that, are, that are appointed by God. And if God brought them into your life, then he's going to give you grace for it, right? If God is bringing the demonized into Life Change Church, he's given us grace for it. If he's going to bring the addicts in the Life Change Church, the crippled, the broken, then he's going to give us grace for it. My job is to find the grace for it and to communicate that grace to it and come to them on their level, not on mine, right? Because all I'm going to do is overwhelm them. I'm going to end up destroying them. And then they'll say, I cannot meet Pastor Greg's standard. That's why I'm not going to do that to people. And I encourage you, go back, read uh, 1 Corinthians 7. It's going to talk about in relationships just maintain your level of freedom in him and, and, and live outside of that freedom. Bring that freedom into the lives of other people because it says an unsanctified wife will make the husband holy and, and, and the children will be holy. There's a power of righteousness that's working in your life. And I need you to trust it in yourself so you can trust it working in the people around you. All right. So anyways, that's all I got today, guys. But it's just you know, it's, it's been on my heart and I'm getting a lot of calls about relationships and, and, you know, and, and JD mentioned, you know, her husband, it's, it's tough on men because men want to be the protector and the provider, you know? So there's that certain level of pride. And that's why I recommend with men get with other men. I went to a, I went to a, a breakfast a, a couple months ago and, you know, I'm always in my shorts and flip-flops. You know, I know I got about four pastors there. I got about 60 men you know, there's several churches that are there. Nobody knows me, you know, and, and Pastor Darren got up and, and kind of closed the thing out. And he looked over at me. He goes, he goes, Pastor Greg, he goes, can you come up and talk to the man? He goes, I need you to pray for him and lay hands on him. And so God had already been speaking to me about some of the issues that, that, that were in the audience. And, um, and so there's about 60 men there. And I said, if you're dealing with, with pornography uh, and if you're dealing with addiction, these are Christian men. If you're dealing with those issues, I need you to come up front right now. I said, Jesus is going to deliver you. And so I prayed over people, the power of God manifested and, and, and men were hitting the floor. Some of the men were crying, but it's something that can only be done in their environment. You know, they're not coming to church on Sunday as a father, you know, saying, hey, I struggle with porn and hey, can you pray for me? No, you know, we have men's events where, you know, these are things that men have to get together with other men and to, to communicate with other men. But it also forces me to be very transparent with people and let people know these are my struggles. Why? So I can connect people in the place of their womb, right? So you're always gonna hear from me, 
then I'm going to connect with the wound. Now, why do I say this? Because I can speak about my past. I could speak about my wounds from four years old, from eight years old, 14 years old. In the different traumatic events, I can speak to them freely because I've gone through deliverance. You know, I've, I've been healed of the wounds of my past. And what that healing does is it allows you to communicate the trauma, the abuse, the things that you've been through, because through forgiveness, God disconnected the entanglements and attachments that connected the pain to it. So I can communicate about my past in, in my shortcomings without the pain being attached to it, because now there's freedom and Jesus freed me from it. But it allows me in that testimony to go to other men and say, bro, I know the struggle. You know, I know what it's like to, to be, be raised in, and because I have alcoholics on both sides of the family. I know what it's like to deal with alcoholism. You know, I could tell you relatives who, who died because of opioids, uh, because of oxy. You know, um, I, I dealt with all this stuff. I, this is family. It's, it's, it's right here, right? And, and, and you look at a guy on the stage, you're like, oh, you know, he doesn't know about that. It's like, oh, no, I know it all too well. But what you're looking at is somebody that's been freed from that because I met Jesus, who's my deliverer, right, and my healer. So we have to minister and walk out our freedom and allow God to expand your boundaries into other people's lives without cramming it down their throat, without telling them what they need to do to fix themselves or what book they need to read and, and all this other stuff. Here's what they need to do. Just show up to church. Just show up to church and let God start working on different areas of their life. You support them. You encourage them. But trust in God enough that the Holy Spirit is going to start transforming them. They just need to make a commitment to be willing to change. That's all they need. They don't need another sermon. They don't need stuff crammed down their throat. They just need to know that you're for them and not against them and that you believe that there's good inside of them. And ministry is simply digging through the dirt in their hearts and pulling out the gold and showing them that, that they're valuable. They weren't a mistake, right? That God has something for their lives. Remember when we reset bones, we reset it, it'll heal itself. When we bring salvation into somebody's life and get them aligned with purpose, guess what? It will grow just like a broken bone that was set correctly. Their spirit and their soul, if planted in the house, and if connected to the house, they're going to grow. Trust the process. That's all I got. So I'm going to go ahead and pray you guys out. And and uh, I don't know how to, who, who is that? Oh, trying to see. Who, oh, Deanna. There you go. It says, it says Dean on there. I'm like, didn't have your whole name. What's going on, Deanna? So I just wanted to speak on... Uh... The faith aspect, before I came to your guys' church, uh, I wasn't really big on faith. I didn't think that God would do things for me because I always saw it happening to everyone else. So I was like, oh, he hasn't done that for me at all. And then uh, working with you guys and going through these classes and coming up to the altar, I started to have more faith. And with what I've been going through lately, I usually have anxiety attacks when you know I'm being attacked by a bigger force than myself. And instead of you know, freaking out this time. My lawyer is like, you should work out a deal with this person. And I'm like, no, God's got me. I'm not working out any deals. And so that's not what the Bible tells me to do. The Bible tells me to do what I'm supposed to be doing. And I'm supposed to be fighting for myself right now because I have God on my side. And I didn't take any of those stupid deals. And it worked out for me in the end because I had faith that I didn't need that dumb deal. Because the deal was just completely stupid. It, had, it wasn't for me. It was for the other person. And I was like, I am not doing that. I have faith and I'm running with it. And he looked at me and he was just like, when you say stuff to people like lawyers, they just think you're completely insane. You know, because they're like, no, we're going to do the research on this. I said, I don't need your research. I know that God has got this. And um, he came back to me at the last minute. He's like, are you sure you don't want to work out a deal? And I was like, no, God's got this. And at the end of the day, he had it. The person that was against me just decided to uh, plead the fifth and went on with their lives. And I was like, see, at the end, he's like, this never really happens. And I said, what did I tell you? I told you that God's got this. He had it. I said, see, and you know what? No response from him. Nothing. It's, I guess he's not a believer, but I was just like, I told you. But you know what? It, it speaks volumes. And, and here's the thing. I've, I've sat there and watched you guys and, and, and the hand of God moving in you guys' lives. And, and you're growing at your pace, right? But right. 
you know, and, and for those who don't know, Deanna's come up to me. She's, she's given me words of knowledge for people and, you know, and, and things that, you know, and, and Deanna and Josh are kind of quiet people, but, you know, I've seen Deanna step out. I've seen Josh step out and, and start telling me what God's been doing in their lives. And, and, and that's it. They're starting to experience, you know, that level of freedom. And, and are they dealing with attacks? You know, yeah, there's, there's certain areas in their life that that's growing, but anytime that there's an attack, God is also pointing out the area that you're going to get breakthrough in. And what does an attack do? It simply shows you where you need to focus your faith on next, right? So, you know, right now your, your kids are getting free and, and God is touching every aspect of your lives. But the good thing is in this last week, you guys, you guys turned to, to the end of the chapter and you started a new one. And, and I'm excited for what God's doing in your life. And, and I know a lot of you, because I talked to a lot of you, have just tremendous testimonies. James, we just got him into a condo last week. And uh, and man, um, we've been working our butts off to get him into a place, but it just didn't work out. But it just so happens that the listing agent's good friends with the loan officer and uh, needed some grace going there. And, and you know, so he's got into a new place and, and uh, you know, there's new job opportunities that people are getting. So everybody is making breakthrough, you know? And, and so even if it's just your own freedom from, you know, addiction or whatever it is, everybody is on a certain level. But here's what I know. When you come into Life Change Church, the Bible says the testimony of Jesus is, is a spirit of prophecy, meaning whatever it is somebody else is dealing with, I can part you, partner you with somebody in our church that has had breakthrough in that area, with, which not only prophesies to your situation because a prophetic word will change current circumstance and future circumstance, but it's a word that will change your life. So it's just awesome. And, and I'm glad that you guys are getting breakthrough. Um, I'm going to continue pressing in and uh, I'm growing. I'm going to a different level in, in, in people's freedom. And, and when I get done with this class, you know, we're all going to sit down and we're going to revamp some of the materials because, you know, we're doing a, a, a deliverance, um, you know, and, and breakthrough starts next week. So if you guys want to get in, get back into that, that's fine. Um, I am going to sign a different book. Um, you know, I'll, 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 I'll publish that on, on Facebook this week. So anyways, let's go ahead and I'm going to pray you guys out. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus and Lord bless everybody here, Lord. Bless them, bless their families, Lord God. You said the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil or sorrow. And you said you would also keep them, Lord God. So I plead the blood of Jesus over each and every one of them, their kids, their assets, their stuff, Lord God. Lord, that you would put angels about them, Lord God, that would minister to your people, Lord, that would comfort your people, that would continue to deliver your people. Protect them, Lord God. I thank you that it's our covenant right in Isaiah 54 and 17, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Lord, I thank you that you have grace for your people today. Lord, I thank you that you have an experience and a word waiting for them today, Lord God, because you're going to change some things in their lives, Lord God. We don't worry about tomorrow because we got grace for today. So we walk out that grace knowing, Lord God, that everything is working for us because of we're in alignment with you. So Father, I thank you for our covenant rights that take care of every need. But Lord, I thank you that you're showing us areas where you want to give us breakthroughs into the impossible, the areas that our faith needs to be applied, Lord God, but you've already overcome. So Lord, I thank you for every impossible situation. Lord Jesus, you overcame, so we overcome. We fight from victory, not for it. So I bless your people, and I thank you for each and every person in Jesus' name. Amen, you guys. All right, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to close this thing out. And um, uh, Christian, do you have anything?